Okay, so now we're going to look at how color vision works. Uh, there's the cones that actually have these different frequency tunings, as I mentioned, and they're a little bit weird. We, we generally conceptually think of them as red, green, and blue, but you can kind of see here that there is a, a clear blue case down here that's detecting the kind of short wavelengths of light where it's blue color. Um, the medium wavelength is our green detector. The red side is just a little bit different than the, than the medium wavelength detector. So it's kind of not exactly red per se, but it's more red than the green guy. And so anyway, you can think of it as red, green, and blue. Um, the only thing that's really important is that it's different than the other detector. And that difference, and especially this kind of tuning curve, this graded response as a function of the different wavelengths, allows us to interpolate any particular point in this wavelength frequency here, um, anywhere, any point in the spectrum as driving a unique pattern of activity in the short, medium, and long uh, cones. And that's really what your visual system is doing, is representing this whole spectrum of, of frequency of light with just three very efficient detectors with these very broad tuning curves. So like right here, this particular color of green, you would have equal activity in the medium and the long detectors. If you go over here more towards this kind of red color here that we would call like a true red, um, there you're having more of the long frequency detector and then less of the medium frequency and no blue. And likewise, as you come over here into this kind of green blue area, you get different amounts of the medium and short wavelength detectors, depending on where you are in that spectrum. That's a mode of processing that actually applies throughout the visual system using these very broad tuning curves to achieve very efficient encoding using a relatively few neurons because we have a lot of visual information that we can encode. Okay, so that's what's happening in the, in the cones in the retina. And then from there, you get these opponent processes that are combining the red and the green and the blue and yellow. Now wait, who said anything about yellow? Where does yellow come from? Okay, well it turns out you have to make yellow from red and green, okay? So here, when we, when we have uh, to, to get these kind of two pairs, if you only have three detectors, you need to sort of combine the medium and the long into a yellow color, um, and then that is con contrasted against the blue. And so this is a classic example of the importance of contrast in the brain. Um, we don't see and we don't process the absolute information. We only process how relatively red versus how relatively green something is, and likewise how relatively blue versus how relatively yellow it is. And that, that tug of war that we looked at in the neuroscience chapter is exactly what's happening here. We're getting a tug of war between red, green, and blue, yellow. And that is critical for allowing us to do those color contrasts that give rise to our ability to perceive uh, the true color of things out in the world. The third case here is actually the luminosity contrast between light and dark. You can think of that as a sort of similar case of these kind of color contrasts. And there's plenty of evidence for these opponent pot process colors. In this video, as you can see here, what you're gonna see is just these pink dots, okay? So they're activating the red uh, detectors, so to speak, um, even though they're pink. Um, and then uh, you're gonna see them turn off in one place, okay? And critically, there is no green signal coming in at all, okay? You're only seeing pink dots and you're seeing those pink dots getting turned off. Take my word for it, okay? If you stare at it, you can kind of see that that's what you're seeing. But now, if you kind of stare at that central fixation point, the cross in the middle, you should get a vivid sensation, especially as you continue to stare at it. I'm getting it very strongly now a very vivid sensation of a green dot rotating around this circle, okay? And if you can't see it this way, again, pull up the link and look at it. Um, so that green dot does not exist. That is, there's no green ever being shown. And that's kind of evidence that in fact, what we're, what's happening is that those red uh, detectors that are being activated by the red color 
are actually getting a little bit tired. They're getting a little bit worn out um, because they're constantly active. And so when you take them away, it turns out that the white that is there, okay, which white is all colors mixed together, as you may know, um, that white ends up actually activating a bit more of the green. The green is more easily excited. And so you see the green just because the white is kind of activating everybody and the, and the green uh, detectors are more easily activated. Okay, <laughs> you've probably seen things like this. Um, this is not a video, this is a static slide. Uh, you can stare at it and again, you're seeing, of course, the blue, yellow contrast colors. Um, and now if you stare at this and especially you have to keep your eyes moving, if you keep your eyes fixed, it doesn't move. But once you move your eyes around, that motion of your eyes interacting with this pattern of colored contrast makes it seem like that thing is moving, okay? And it's a very similar principle to that adaptation that you see with the, with the uh, moving dot illusion, the green dot that we just saw. Okay, I'm not gonna stare at that too long. Uh, there's also contrast effects in time. And again, we talked about how contrast, this relativity principle operates in both time and space. Here's an example uh, in time. You stare at this cube. This is called the Necker cube. And inevitably, at some point, you see it with this face here looking kind of up and to the right. And if you keep staring at it, it can move to the back. Okay, so now for me, it's in the back. Uh, it was in the front. You, you, you get this kind of spontaneous uh, alternation. And again, we think that the neurons that are coding for these different kind of perspectives, these different ways of interpreting the scene, uh, get tired, they fatigue, and that's what causes this transition between the two states. Here's another example. Uh, anytime you have any of these kind of bistable displays where you can kind of see things one way or the other, and this again contrasts with the dress example where most people can see it one way or the other, and then your brain kind of naturally switches back and forth. And so if you stare at this long enough, you're seeing at one time you see the chest pieces, right? Okay, and then all of a sudden your brain switches and now you see the faces, these funny little goofy faces here. Okay, so uh, again, your brain kind of uh, has that sensitivity to changes over time. Neurons get tired, they wanna see something new. You wanna see the new thing.